To begin with, let me make three things clear. Firstly, this is not my story. I am just its recorder. I am in this, of course, but it is her story, Columbia Channon's. Secondly, this account is fashioned from what she tells me, along with my direct observation, and from my interpolation, extrapolation, and triangulation of the data. As the recorder of this, I have tried to stay out of the data as much as I can, to avoid interference, though it was not always possible. Lastly, this is only my research, my study of humanity, the examination of a particular idea, ultimately a form of instruction. If she, Columbia Channon, wishes to call it a love story, that's her choice. Now I will try to step aside as much as possible, record, and analyze. I know hotel rooms. I have seen many, I even like them, and this hotel room in Paris is particularly fine. Mirrors and paintings in Baroque frames, thick curtains blocking out the night, intelligently arranged furniture in reds and golds, a chair here, a divan there, a table, a desk. There's no bed. That's in the adjoining room. In one chair is Columbia Channin, legs crossed, arms crossed. Her face is ashen, like a person back from the dead. And she has fresh cuts and bruises on her hands, and a bandage above her right eye that is barely disguised by brushing her light hair forward over it. She's dressed badly. She mutters that she has nothing, no personal possessions anymore, and even the grey tracksuit and white sneakers she's wearing are borrowed from the hospital. Only the charm around her neck is actually hers, she says, and she still doesn't know where it came from. For a long while she just stares at the machine facing her, settled on the divan. It's different from any machine she's ever seen before, an elongated head of sculpted pale rubber shining pearl platinum eyes that appear to have been welded on subsequent to the machine's original manufacture just above the gash of a proto mouth the short broad torso is clothed as are the legs and arms in a suit and tie the feet are shod expensively and the hands five long fingers on each barely a palm are covered with the same pale rubber as the head she's thinking i know that this is a machine that someone tried to make look like a human. Who are you? she asks. In fact, what are you? A seeker of the truth, the machine responds. That was clever. That's the manipulation compartment's doing. After all, she sees herself as a seeker, too. The machine doesn't use a metallic voice like you'd expect, but it's cold like blue precise like wiring. A voice I particularly like. I applaud this choice out of the limitless number of voices the machine can summon. It doesn't have any of the richness of a human voice with the persuasion and cant, hidden desires and distorted self-reflections. I think she will trust this voice. A seeker of the truth, she asks. Like what? The machine replies, like you. She narrows her eyes. I meant what truths are you seeking? Everything, says the machine. From what happened yesterday to... She interrupts, suddenly angry. If you want that kind of truth, why don't you just go down there yourself and look at all the bodies on the ground, or see if you can find any floating in the river? Don't forget to look at the bottom of the river. The machine studies her anger. The bodies have all been removed now, Columbia, even the ones at the bottom of the river. She stares silently back at the machine, trying not to imagine all the dead being taken away, taken somewhere, a hospital, maybe an abandoned warehouse turned into a makeshift mortuary or a school gym. She finally speaks. All those people falling from the sky her fingers dance in the air like rain. Then she says, I have a theory of truth, you know. Is that the kind of truth you're seeking? How people end up falling like rain? The machine doesn't answer this. I want to know your story, 
it says instead. So you're a reporter then? No, it says, not a reporter. I don't need to tell others. She laughs grimly. It's not a nice story. The machine appears to shift uncomfortably on the divan, but it's just for effect. It has never needed comfort. All it ever needs to function is power. Not food, not drink, not rest. But then, at this moment, neither does she. The machine speaks again. I want to know if poverty makes people proud, Columbia. I want to know if lost people can become found. I want to know if people can change. I don't have those answers. She tips her head, deeply curious. Is that what my story is to you? Do you think I've become some kind of a new creature? I don't know yet, Columbia. Have you? I can tell the machine has tempted her. She's opening herself to it, to the magic of this strange interview. No human could have done what the machine has accomplished. Sure, you can have my story, she says finally. Thank you, says the machine. It'll be 100,000 plus 50,000 to get me out of the contract my uncle put me into. Say 150,000 all in. The machine nods. Yes, 150,000. The manipulation compartment quickly complains that the machine spoke too soon. But it doesn't matter. The machine could spend a million on this. A billion if it wants. She's surprised, I can tell but covers it deftly with a cynical laugh. I should have asked for more, then. Plus a week at this place, this hotel, until I figure out where to go next, what to do next. She stares at the ceiling. I need to change things. Maybe I need to try to... She loses the words, uncertain or maybe unable to speak them. What, Columbia? asks the machine. She swallows. I think maybe I have to fight now. The machine probes. Fight for something or against something. Her gaze drifts off to the window. I don't know and I'm not sure how. The machine waits for her attention to return. Can we start now, Columbia, tonight? I can talk all night if you want, she says. Then unexpectedly, she's suddenly miserable, vulnerable. I've got nothing better to do than talk. It's nearly midnight now. To get her whole story, the machine must have her go right back to the beginning. But she's changeable, evasive, and she doesn't yet fully understand what she's been through. It has to keep asking her to go back further, further. Not Idinu, not Amonculus, not Riverworld. Not what happened to Jane. Not what happened at Rosa Rota. She keeps choosing these starting points, but they aren't right. There's too much omitted or unexplained. The machine needs the whole story. And each compartment of the machine wants to know the whole story. The machine has 428 compartments. Some of these compartments deal with higher functions. Rationalization, elicitation, Manipulation, misdirection, legal compliance. Some deal only with the lower functions of power and mobility and threat avoidance. The higher function compartments are hanging on her every word, and those that deal with the lower functions are like children, listening to an outlandish fairy tale they can't quite comprehend. She starts again. This is for the fourth time. All right. I'll tell you when it all began, she says. It all began when I gave up. The machine considers this statement. It's honest, and this time it may perhaps lead to the true beginning. But it's also vague, insufficient. Gave up? Gave up what, Columbia? There. That's the elicitation compartment. Her head is in her hands now. I don't know you just kind of give up. She looks up, shrugs. I don't know why I'd expect a machine to understand. The machine is unruffled by the implication that it cannot empathize, but doesn't argue. Again, gave up what, Columbia? She rolls her eyes. Hope. 
I guess. You give up hope. Hope? The machine stills a twitching finger. She looks at the machine intently. Yes, the theory of hope. One, hope is like a picture, sharp, real, like a photograph. Two, it has to be possible, even if only just. Imagine hope without possibility. That's a different theory altogether. Three, you can't give up. The machine is intrigued. You have a theory of hope. Yes, she replies. And yet you gave up, Columbia. Doesn't that violate the third part of your theory? That's the rationalization compartment at work. Yes, she replies. The machine considers this theory and her violation of it. What happened, Columbia? What are the events that made you give up? She brings it back to her mind, the scene in the classroom, the window looking out over the grounds. I can see the vulnerability in those narrowed blue eyes. Her voice is a whisper now. It was only 20 feet down, I guess, maybe 25. It was the second floor, and there were these ugly bushes beneath the window. It's still dangerous to fall that far, you know. They were pushing me out of the window head first. I could have landed badly, broken my neck. I could have hit my head on a rock, or got a twig through my eye, or I could have broken an arm or leg, or both, or all four, or all four and my neck. Anyway, I guess I must have turned in the air as I fell, because I remember I landed on my left side. My elbow and knee hit first, I think, then my head, then the other arm and leg. I got all this dirt in my mouth, so probably I was shouting something as I fell, but I don't really remember. The machine speaks. You were defenestrated. Columbia nods. Defenestrated, yes. And those girls who did it to me? You know they all called me D after that. D for defenestrated. Do you find that funny? No, the machine replies. No, she says. It isn't funny at all. She exhales, thoughtful. Somehow, falling always stayed with me, you know, after that. I have a theory of falling, too. I'll tell you that later if you want. There was this time I threatened to kill myself. Not so long ago, I went up this tree really high and said I would throw myself down. Yes, Columbia. The machine leans forward. Another sham gesture. I know I was there. That completely surprises her. You were? How? The machine isn't there to answer her questions. No, this is your story, Columbia, not mine. She shrugs. Sure, it's your 150,000. She looks away, suddenly sad. Then there was this time I was above the top of the world, incredibly high. I nearly fell then, a really seriously long way. The machine inclines its head in a slight nod. I was there also, Columbia. Impressed, she whistles through the side of her mouth where there's a tooth missing. You sure get around, machine. The machine continues its questioning. What happened then, after they threw you out of the window? She replies, Why ask? Surely you were there too. She smiles. A moment of humor, a moment in which she's unexpectedly beautiful. No, I wasn't there, Columbia. Yes, she says, yes, there was this one last thing. So I'm lying there, half in the bushes and half in the dirt, when I look up and see him, and he says, are you okay? Like, how could I possibly be okay? I'd just been thrown out of a window. So I shout something unprintable at him, and he leaves without saying anything. The machine prompts her, and? That's when I gave up. She's totally vulnerable now. That exact moment I gave up. She smiles at the machine, one of those helpless smiles that you only ever see when someone's about to cry. But she doesn't cry. If the machine were a human, it would have knelt beside her, and held her in its arms, comforted her. 
Instead, it says, when did this happen, Columbia? Almost three years ago, she replies, I was 15. The machine considers this. Tell me about before that. She doesn't reply. She's looking away, still thinking about falling. Without any comfort, she falls back on pride. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, she says. There's scorn in her voice, intellectual contempt. Have you heard that before? Did you ever say it to one of your machine relatives when they malfunctioned? She softens. But tell me, machine, what about the people who aren't made stronger, who are just killed? What about the people who can't take any more, can't be made stronger, who wish they'd just be killed anyway? Do you understand? Rightly, the machine doesn't argue maxims with her, and the elicitation compartment takes over. Tell me about before that. It's with command now, a finger raised to make the point. Now it's midnight. I can see her thinking. I can almost discern what she's thinking. She's thinking, I'll tell this machine my whole story, every ghastly moment that ought to be buried unspoken, and every extraordinary amazing act that raised me back up. Good. Very good. This is progress.